This is episode 199 of the Beyond the Food Show, and today we're tackling the good and bad food. Surely, there has to be a list of healthy food, and what about the unhealthy food? We're going to answer that question, and it may shock you. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Going to Beyond the Food Show. I'm Stephanie Dozier, clinical nutritionist and emotional eating expert, creator of the Going to Beyond the Food method and founder of the Going to Beyond the Food Academy. Corporate executive turned health expert with my own journey with weight, body image and food. It's now my mission to help smart, successful women like you live confidently right now and unconditionally. Ready, sister? Let's do this. Hello, sisters. Welcome back. Well, it is summertime right now, July 29th. It is Monday morning when I'm recording this, and we're full on in the midst of it in North America. You guys are vacationing, so perhaps you're listening to this while driving up to the cottage or on your road trip with the kids. And while you're doing that, we're working on upgrading a lot of our program, how we deliver them, and then adding content to it. Like one of the main benefits of being a Going Beyond the Food Academy student is that you have lifetime access, which means you're getting all the upgraded content forever and beyond. And if you're a student and you haven't seen the post yet, we are about to add three brand new courses to your platform. Isn't it cool? Now, here's the other thing I've been working on is turning our intuitive eating project. So for the last four months, we've been doing a very narrow focus program on teaching women how to become intuitive eater. It's a short program, it's five weeks, and it's been on dates, right? We've been releasing it, I think the first one was in April or May, and then in June, and now we are making this course available ongoing, what we call a lingo of business evergreen. So the Intuitive Eating Project is now available for you whenever you want to start it. You don't have to wait for a date. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the show note at stephaniedozi.com slash 199 and request an invitation because not everyone gets in. So we have a process for that. So make sure that you request your invitation, which this topic of intuitive eating leads me into the topic of today, good and bad food. And that's a huge topic inside of our program, particularly around week four, where we begin to talk about health in the context of intuitive eating. And this is a mistake I see many women make when they learn intuitive eating on their own, is that there are still putting a label on food, even though they have released the when to eat and how much to eat and the food policing around like typical dieting behavior, they're holding on to their own list of healthy food and unhealthy food because there has to be one, right? And that's what leads them in never really achieving intuitive eating because they're still holding on to that concept. And that's what I want to talk about today. What are the good and bad foods? Why are we so obsessed with food labeling? What motivates the need for us to label food, the side effect of food labeling? And is there an option for you, intuitive eater, or people who want to become intuitive eater to not label food? Are you ready to do this? Let's get started. I want to bring you at a higher level than good and bad food. I want you to think about the concept of good and bad, this dichotomous way of thinking about anything. Yes, it's around food. Yes, it's around health, but it's around everything. And we live in a society that support black and white thinking, dichotomous thinking within, example, our educational system, our political system, not only promotes it, but creates it in the way we live our life, which makes our life that much more complex. 
And then it taps into a side of us as human that likes to have control because control makes us feel safe. So as a result of that, as human, we like to put things in a box. It brings us safety because that's the number one goal of human. It's not to make money. It's not to be thin. It's to survive. Like we have a very primal part of us that all we want is to survive, live as long as we can. And then society standard gets layered on top of that. But putting things in the box makes us feel safe. It reduces the mental energy of having to think because everything is decided for us. So when it comes to food, we love good and bad food. We love healthy and unhealthy list of food. And, and that's what diet culture serves us via their diet and also society via the TV, the magazine, the books. And it's fairly recent in which we started to categorize nutrient as good or bad. And one of the main reasons for that is that nutrition science is fairly new. Like we've only started to isolate nutrient in food at the beginning of the 1900s. And even then, it was very primary, right? It wasn't as complicated as where it is today. So we have been through over the last seven years or so, demonizing or labeling certain nutrient that we just discovered, like fat is bad. And then we went through a phase of carbs is bad. And then that went away. And then protein was bad. And now we're back to carb is bad. And now we have another segment is eating in, in whole is bad. That's why we intermittent fast. And now it's not just good or bad, but it's poisonous food like sugar, right? So now we're taking the good and bad and we're putting it in relationship to our entire health. And this good and bad way of thinking around food leads to dieting. And then we start chasing a thinner body for many of us for the last 20, 30, 40 years. We started dieting in our mid-teens and unsuccessfully right? Because diet don't work. So we've been through the loop of dieting for 20 years, let's say. We have lived longer in a diet brain, in the way of thinking around food, good or bad, that now starts to seep through our entire life. It meets where our educational and our political view is in society. And then we start applying this to everything in our life right? It's around food, it's around exercise, it's around politics, and it's around the way we run our family. It's about the cleanliness in our house. It's about how we run our career. So this food labeling that I want to talk about today is really coming from a pattern of thinking that I have often referred to as the diet brain, right? This black and white thinking, now, understanding this higher level point of view, and I want you to appreciate that first, because without all of that, you wouldn't be chasing good and bad food, healthy and unhealthy food. Food would be neutral. And that's where we'll get at the end of the podcast. But I want to take you somewhere else between food as neutral to now, right? Is there, number one, such a thing as good and bad food, healthy and unhealthy food. When we look at nutrition, like nutrition science, one of the principle is that we research nutrient in isolation, right? So we are studying fat by itself and the context of how fat interacts with certain metabolic pathway in our body. When we do nutrition science, very rarely do we study the food as a whole, because then we cannot draw conclusion on a nutrient. So when you read nutrition science, you're reading science in the context of nutrient isolation, 
which is not how we eat as humans. We eat a whole food that contains, in most cases, multiple nutrient, macro and micronutrient. So then when we look at this and we say, well, as science made a list of good and bad food and healthy, unhealthy food, the answer is as of today, no. Because what we do study is nutrient, not food. So then the question is, if there's no such thing as good and bad food and healthy and healthy food, then how do we know what we should and shouldn't eat? That's a good question. Then the answer is, how does the food make you feel? Now, when we ask that question, most people can't answer and it becomes very uncomfortable very quickly. And one of the things we do as human is when we are uncomfortable, we have a self-sabotaging behavior. We avoid this uncomfortable situation. We, in the case of good and bad food or how the food makes you feel, we deny it because we can't feel it. Therefore, that has to be wrong. Therefore, we go back to the good and bad food. And especially if you've been dieting like me for 20 plus years, you're completely disconnected from your body. Like literally, we are head people because everything in relationship to food has been some force of logical thinking, calorie, macros, whatever formula we use, it's been all in our head. And then when somebody like me now comes along and says, well, how does the food make you feel? What do you mean feel? I, I don't know. I've never been asked that question before. Give me a list of food. That's what people will tell me, right? Give me a list of food. I'm very good at following a list. But that's not what I ask you. I ask you, how's the food make you feel? So because of this disconnection, we engage even more in this list of good and bad food. So how does we engage with food? If science does not have a list in good and healthy food, we have to rely on how the food makes us feel. And that's when we go into the world of cultivating a relationship with food based on our own internal cues instead of external cues, right? External cues being good and bad food, healthy, unhealthy food lists and so forth, where we say, how does the food makes you feel? Now for that, you have to acknowledge that you can trust your body, right? Which, which is a whole other segment of this conversation. So if there's no such thing as good and bad food, healthy, unhealthy food, why are we so obsessed about labeling it? And then that is going to get me back to the place of this is how we live in society, right? We are in a society that promotes control, that likes good and bad. And we have a segment of our societal rules that is about being thin, right? Both from an appearance standpoint and from a health standpoint. And we believe that the way to achieve thinness is through control of food, right? And we have the firm belief, right or wrong, that we can control our weight. Therefore, we need to control food. And then we get this list of good and bad food. The problem with this is we are getting value, human value, behind the labeling of the food. Meaning that if you follow the good food list and you're good at controlling the good food in your life, you're better than the person who doesn't follow the list of good food and doesn't control it. Therefore, it gives you a sense of self-worth. 
So now your double exposure to why you want a list of good and bad food, because that's the way society says it should be. And then two, it makes you feel worthy. And then what we're seeing now, and this is fairly recent, is that people develop a sense of self-identity around food, right? I'm vegan. I'm keto. I'm low carb. I, the definition of who you are as a human, gets tangled up around your food. And that's what motivates your desire to label food and to defend it. Because now your self-worth, your self-esteem, your value is tangled around your own list of good and bad food, right? If you're a vegan, your identity around not eating animal product, most of the time linked around political issue is huge, right? You are a better human being because you're vegan. We also see that in the dichotomy of keto, right? You're a better person because you eat almost no carbs and you avoid poisonous sugar and carbohydrate. And that becomes part of your identity. I've seen that so many times in my programs where part of the journey in lesson seven of the academy, for example, it is to delete a lot of your food philosophy social media, right? So if you came to this program with keto, you have to go in and unfollow your keto account. And then people will say to me, well, Stephanie, my profile on Instagram is keto babe. I'm just making that up here. But my profile on Instagram is keto. So you want me to delete my profile? Yeah, I want you to delete your profile and create yourself a profile of you as For an example, Julie, not as keto babe, but as Julie, the woman. So we can start untangling the self-identity with labeling of food. Now let's move on to the side effect of labeling food. Because there is, there is, and this is a holistic show, right? My training and background is holistic health. So there is mental consequence, emotional consequence, physical consequence, and also spiritual consequence. So let me navigate around that. I'm going to get through a number of side effects, and perhaps you will recognize one or many for you. One of the side effects of labeling food is the morale power that we give to food, Food is supposed to be nutrition. It's not supposed to be your morale, like who you are as a person. And when we do that, it sends us into a tailspin of emotional disturbance, guilt, shame, right? And then losing our our identity when we break up from that good and bad food from our food philosophy. And then we're like, who are we if we're not this food identity? So the big consequence of number one is that morale influx that labeling food as good or bad gives us. And then the emotional tailspin that follows that. And that's going to get me into the world of emotional eating, right? When we feel shame and guilt, and we don't know how to process our emotion, which I call emotional intelligence, we then turn to food to make us feel better from the shame and the guilt of having eating the bad food. And guess what food we tend to go to? the food that we've then labeled bad. So we have an emotion we can't deal with, guilt of eating the bad food, and then we want to feel better, and then our primal brain gets attracted to the, say, bad food, we eat it, and then we get into, like, a secondary tailspin right beside it. And then that leads us to overeating, right? One of the 
studied aspect of food restriction and the consequence of dieting is when we restrict food, we tend to overeat on the said restricted food. So overeating is, in most cases, not everything, but in most cases, a consequence of restriction, right? But here's a quick story recently that happened in my DM. Someone was came over to my DMs to ask me question. And when I pointed out to her that she was she was keto, carnivore keto, and I was pointing out to her that she was extremely restrictive in her eating pattern, and that's why she was overeating, she went in complete denial. The reason why she went in complete denial and started arguing heavily with me is because her entire identity is keto carnivore. So by me telling her that the solution is to stop labeling the food, then she lost a sense of self. This is how profound labeling food gets to. Here's another consequence of labeling food. The relationship you have with the say healthy food right? Many people will say, well, the healthy food, let's say greens, right? Spinach, let's say, doesn't taste good. And then they get into the pattern of not liking the good food, quote, the healthy food. And then they'll say, well, I can't eat healthy because it doesn't taste good. But all of that is due to that labeling of food. And then they end up craving the unhealthy food because in their mind, they have associated healthy food as dieting and therefore as not tasting good. Another consequence is the whole self-image that I just talked about, right? When we label good and bad food or healthy or unhealthy food, and we end up not consuming the good food, we have a hit to our self-esteem. And that is often associated with shame. And shame is one of the most studied emotion that produce bodily sensation, right? And that needs to be offset with dopamine hits, which often food gives us. Here's another consequence of food labeling, psychosomatic bodily symptoms. So psychosomatic is when our body creates real, true physical sensation without the trigger being present. So often I see that in the journey of intuitive eating around recently around sugar, right? So people will reintroduce carbohydrate and sugar into their diet and then poof in week four they'll come and post well I started to have knee pain again well the knee pain that is physically being perceived by them it's totally true is actually created by their brain thinking they're eating the bad food right the food that was unhealthy and dangerous for their health that could kill them because that's what some people in certain community like to say about sugar, and then their subconscious brain is running that pattern in the back of their head. Oh my God, you're eating dangerous food. You're eating dangerous food. You got to stop. You got to stop. Boom. The knee pains appear. Psychosomatic symptoms are not something that Stephanie makes up. Like it's totally a field of study. You can also Google placebo effect, which is psychosomatic symptoms as well. I'm going to give you a last one, a consequence of labeling your food, which I think is the most, the one that has the most potential to affect the rest of your life. When you label food, it means that you aren't trusting yourself. This is big, girls. When you label food as good or bad, healthy and unhealthy or whatever lists, you're basically saying to yourself, you aren't worthy of making food choices. And then that starts spreading through your entire life. You are not to be trusted. Therefore, you need to control everything in your life. Everything around your life has to fit within the good and bad person choices boxes that we talked at the very top. And then when you don't trust your body, you also don't trust all the messages that your body sends you along the way. And then you have a risk of developing 
more health condition because the little symptoms that your body has given you way earlier, you don't trust it. And you perhaps, because you don't trust it, suppress it. And then you don't listen to it, you don't listen to it. And then the body just escalate, escalate, escalate to the point where, in my story, I ended up collapsing on stage. Because I wasn't trusting my body and every symptoms or every messages that was given to me earlier, I deny as being inaccurate because my body is not to be trusted. And then it escalated in a much bigger health condition. So what can we do instead of labeling food as good or bad, healthy or unhealthy? We can see food as neutral, right? And a great analogy of that is the analogy of a knife, right? Knife is a knife. In one person's hand, a knife can be a threat. In another person's hand, the knife has no consequence other than perhaps cutting food. It all depends of the context. Who's holding the knife? The knife is neutral. It's what is the context around it that brings then the label as the knife is dangerous or not. The same goes with food. As itself, the food is neutral is the context around food that brings it something that perhaps could have consequence for you. And that's the second thing you need to perhaps engage with is food is neutral, but food has consequence. So based on your bio individuality, certain food perhaps will make you feel better. Certain food will bring you more energy, will make your digestion operates better, will keep your blood sugar more regulated, while in another person, it won't. And by the way, this is the last principle of intuitive eating. It's called gentle nutrition, or as we teach it, chasing health. So it's about asking yourself, how does this food make me feel? And then from there, for from how you want to feel, you then make food choices. The third point or how you can engage with food, if not labeling, is about healing your diet brain. Recognize how distorted your thinking around everything almost everything is in your life, like this whole black and white on and off and how your thought pattern has been impacted by diet and then start working on re-engaging in different thought pattern. I just defined the going to beyond the food method, right? That's what I realized years ago when I was working with women is the real issue, just like with me, it was my thinking not the food. So these are the three things. Let me recap. Food is neutral. Food has consequence. And then healing our diet brain. So here's a good quote from a book I'm reading right now. The Body of Truth. Although we learn to drop magical thinking when it comes to weather, crop, even the care of animal, or other natural phenomenon, we are still magically thinking about food. We think that by eating certain food, we will be achieving the goal that makes us better people. While eating the quote, bad food, makes us less worthy of a person. So the need for us to drop the food labeling is critical in our overall well-being. Dropping the labeling on food brings up the need for us to be responsible for ourselves, to no longer give away our power to diet culture, to the diet gurus, 
to the influencer on Instagram, but in some third around, shift the power back to us. And let me twist that into a bit of a feminism push, but isn't that what we fought for, ladies? Not you and I, as much of our grandmothers, we fought for the right to be in control of our lives, to vote, to work, to be able to open a bank account. Think about that. A hundred years ago, women weren't allowed to have a bank account without their husband or father signing for them. And today... We give our power to diet culture and food labeling. Now, I know this work isn't easy because that's where your mind is at right now. Trust me that when you get yourself through the process of taking back your power, of becoming an intuitive eater that can feel how food makes them feel, you liberate yourself in many aspects of your life. So I encourage you to give it a try, to recognize that you perhaps feel very uncomfortable, that you're afraid, but that you want to give it a try. I would encourage you to work in a support system that's going to help you get through this, hence why we've made the Intuitive Eating Project available to you anytime so you can get started when you feel that you have the courage to face your fear and liberate yourself from food labeling. So there you have it, ladies. Now I have a quick exercise for all of you because I've been told through many feedback that you guys love this little exercise. So Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down a list of food that you consider bad and a list of food that you consider good. Then I want you to, instead of going about eating just the good food and avoiding the bad food, I want you to perhaps try one of the quote bad food and see how it makes you feel and journal it and write it and share it with us, perhaps via social media or an email. I would love to hear from you. So make a list of good and bad food, pick one of the bad food, consume it and see how it makes you feel. And then from there, you can make your own individual empowered choices about good and bad food. So there you have it. Ladies, I'm going to start talking about podcast review. So I've looked at the statistic of the podcast and I need your help. And one of the ways to do this is through podcast review. So you're going to hear me talk about this over the next three months consistently because I want to be able to rank this podcast higher on iTunes so that it shows up on people's feed as a interesting to listen type of podcast so we can share the message of going beyond the food. So today, as you end this podcast, go on your podcast app and leave a review. It's very easy to do, particularly around iPhones. And if you don't have an opportunity to do that on your phone, go to the show notes, stephaniedoze.com slash 199, and you'll have a button there for you to leave a review. So I would love for you to tell me how the podcast has impacted your life. And then together, we can share this message to more women. I love you girls. And I'll see you on the next podcast.